Can you hear me? Yes, my name is Seth Johnson. I'm the Vice President with the College of Democrats. Uh, thank you all for coming to the Senate Forum tonight. Uh, both candidates were invited to this. However, uh, Tommy Telco had five minutes, so we could not make it tonight. And we want to thank uh, Lydia Maxwell and all the College Republicans for co-hosting this forum with us so we can form the student body and just stay as well. Like you said, I'm Lydia Maxwell. I'm the chair of College Republicans, and I just want to thank the Judge on the campaign for being able to come tonight and to answer questions from Auburn students. And we're really excited. And our moderator tonight is Dr. Williamson. Um, so he'll be asking questions to Senator Bush.
understands we're still in the middle of a pandemic, so that's why we're all wearing masks and said, I'm still far back. So um, thank you. Thank you all for being here. I, I'm all yours. Thank you, Senator. Uh, with that, um, we want to give you as many questions as possible, so we'll start with uh, this one. Um, there's no name. If you would like to read your own question, uh, feel free to write your name on it, and we will uh, call you up so that you may ask it. Um, but I've got a number of cards here that don't have names, so I will take the responsibility of reading them. Uh, this first one says, nobody is perfect, not even our leaders. Uh, what would you say has been your biggest mistake since you took office as a senator? <laughs> All right, some of you don't like this and some of you aren't. My biggest mistake is vote for Bill Barr. I think he's been, I, I've been so disappointed in Bill Barr as Attorney General. I, I was so, it's, I, I thought that for, I, look, I felt sorry for Jeff Sessions because I actually, I've known Jeff for a long time and I think he took a lot of hits that he should have. I disagreed with him on a lot of policy issues. But I don't believe he deserved the treatment that he got from the president because I had been in the Justice Department. I was there as an assistant U.S. attorney. I was there as a U.S. attorney. And he did the right thing by recusing himself. No question about that. Every ethics, ethics guy will tell you that. He didn't deserve what he got, but the department, because of the hits he was taking, was suffering. The FBI was suffering. And I knew Bill Barr uh, from his reputation back when he was attorney general earlier. And I thought he would be an independent voice. I thought he would uh, restore professionalism. That's been a big, that was a mistake. I wish I would, if I could go back, I'd probably do different. I don't think he's been that independent voice. There's probably some others. I, I know that there are others, but I, I, I don't think, quite frankly, I, I gotta explain how we go through this process. Uh, I don't look at things from a political standpoint when I vote. What I do is I try to get my staff and we learn and we research and we try to figure out the best thing to do. And I vote on principle. Uh, I, I voted with the best information I had on the Attorney General. Uh, it turned, I turned out to be, to be wrong. He has not been in the voice. But the votes that I've taken, um, I will defend. Every vote I've taken, I will defend. Uh, because I've been hit from the right and I've been hit from the left. I've been hit by Republicans, and I've been hit by Democrats, and that means I've had a pretty independent voice for the people out there. Wonderful, thank you. At the other end of the spectrum, another student asks, what piece of legislation are you most proud of passing? That would be the military widow tax. Uh, let, let me explain that just, just briefly, what that is. For 30-something years, uh, and, and this doesn't affect but about 2,000 people in Alabama, it was so important. For, two, for over 30-something years, um, what are those who had, whose spouse had died of a military uh, injury or death, a service-related injury or death, had two pots of money, one that the VA administered and another pot that they paid for out of their own pocket, extra insurance. And it doesn't sound like an awful lot of luck. For 30 years, it happened is that the, the Department of Justice, I mean, the Department of Defense and the VA offset each other. So they were not getting what they paid for. They were not getting what they, they were due. They were only getting about 55 cents on the dollar. Every year for over 20 years, these gold star widows would come up to Capitol Hill. And every year they'd get patted on the back. And all these uh, politicians would tell them, yes, we're, we're with you. We owe a duty to you. You know, you, you served and your, your spouse served. And we, we're here to help. And every year, when it came down to it, they voted for money over the duty that we had to our veterans' families. And I didn't know about it. I met with these widows for the first time in 2019. They came in early. And my staff and I got together. And we decided that we were going to change it. We, we went against all odds. We got, I got Susan Collins from Maine to co-sponsor the bill with me. We worked and we ended up getting them. almost 80 co-sponsors. I think we ended up with 78 co-sponsors in this bill. We got it in our National Defense Authorization. They still didn't believe we could do it. And they got in the NDAA because we got the, uh, the widow. Every military, every veterans organization had it at the top of their priority. And i got to tell you folks, I, I, it, that may not sound like it's not the Voting Rights Act. It's not the Civil Rights Act. But for those military families, for those widows who were denied just $1,000, $1,200 a month, it meant so much. And the day that that passed, I had 30 of those widows sitting in the, in the balcony. 
And I'm going to tell you, it was, it was amazing. It was an emotional day. It was an incredible day. And it just reinforced to me what you can do when you help people and you get together and you reach across the aisle and you work together. But at the end of the day, what I do in the United States Senate is not about politics. It's about service and it's about people and how they're affected. So that was, a, that was the highlight uh, of my three years, almost three years. Great. This next question comes from Coleman Mantel. Would you like to ask your question, Coleman? Um. Uh, there's a lot of talk with how uh, partisan. Um, Take your mask off, Coleman. The, the distance is bad enough. That's okay. There's a lot of talk with how partisan politics abide in the Senate um, of taking measures in terms of procedural measures to um, get certain agendas on both sides passed depending on who controls after the election. Would you support the abolition of the Senate filibuster? No. Short answer. Uh, look, let me give you a little bit of background. And, and one, one of the reasons I say that is because you're, you're, you're absolutely right that people change the rules to, to do things because somebody's done something to them. What we're seeing in this country with this bipartisanship, we're seeing a pendulum going from right to left, left to right, right to left, without anything in the middle. And it's the middle folks like me who really need to be there to get things done. And so I, I came up, my first job, uh, out of law school in 1979 was working in the Senate. I worked for the late Howell Bethlehem from Alabama. And there's a great book out of here. If you really are interested in government and politics, read The Last Great Senate by Ira Shapiro. And it's about a time when they were in regular order and they were working together. They had their partisan differences. But those two Congresses in the Senate worked so hard. Robert Byrd was a Democratic leader. Uh, Howard Baker was a, a Republican leader. Howard Baker from Tennessee. And they would fight like cats and dogs over policy, but at the end of the day, they would also work together because they would not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And so my concern of what we're seeing now, we have seen the, the institution of the United States Senate just go down and down and down in terms of its credibility because of the very kind of things that you're talking about. It started mainly with judges. Democrats started it when they started breaking the filibuster rule with judges. Mitch McConnell took it to a new level, all the way to the Supreme Court, all the way to some other things. I think what happened with, uh, you know, uh, with the tax bill, with some other things, and they tried to pull some tricks. So the bottom line is, I have too much respect for the institution of the Senate. And I think you're gonna, we're going to need some voices in the Democratic caucus, though, to push back on that, because there will be a push. We're already seeing it. We're already hearing it. There is going to be a push. I don't think Joe Biden will do that as president. At least he won't start out that way. Joe has also got a history of bipartisanship and working with folks uh, on both sides of the aisle. So I don't think he will do that. I think we will try to do what we can to find common ground. That's the way the Senate was made to operate. It's the why it was always called the most deliberative body in the world. Um, I want to get back that way. And I'm working hard to try to make it that way. Thank you. This next question comes from Olivia Pope. Would you like to ask, ask your question? Sure. Alabama is a very agriculturally based state, and Vice President Biden has promised environmentally friendly agriculture with a goal of zero emissions. How do you plan to support the farmers of Alabama through this possibly expensive endeavor? Good question. Uh, look, look, I don't think they're inconsistent, though. I, I really don't think they're inconsistent. And it's not a process that all of a sudden you're going to do, do overnight. Okay, uh, I, I backed uh, some things with regulations that gave farmers some leeway and some break. And I think we have to continue to do that. Uh, I've just been a huge proponent of agriculture. The problem that we're getting into now, right now, is because the agriculture department right now is helping the big, big farmers and not the Alabama farmers. They have hurt the Alabama farmers. The tariff wars hurt the Alabama farmers. Alabama farmers don't want handouts uh, like they've been getting. They don't want to see the government propping them up every year like that, that they've had to do over the last three years. I think we've got to have the assistance. I put protections in there for them. And I think there will be protections in environmental regulations that are unique to farmers because it is a unique industry. 
So I really don't believe they're inconsistent, but it is going to take some, it, it's going to be a challenge to try to work this out. The, the, the bottom line is that I believe in the science, and so do farmers. And farmers are going to have to uh, understand and look because it is in their best interest that we do something about climate because of the problems that we're seeing right now. So I don't think it's inconsistent, but I don't have a specific plan right now. But you can count on the fact that I'm going to be there to help protect the farmers, but also work with them to get them to say because they're going to be the best resource of how they can help with clean energy and also be productive. This next student uh, question comes from a student who is a hopeful future physician. Uh, there's not a name on it, but do you recognize your question and would you like to ask it about uh, trusting the scientific community? Uh, hopeful, hopeful physician, future <laughs> physician. I, I will read it then. Uh, so, so the question says, what kind of message do you want to send to Alabamians and Americans broadly about trusting the scientific community and what impact do you think this message would have? Trust them. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I, I, I'll talk about it. Look, I, one of the most frustrating things I see these days, and, and we see it in climate issues, we see it in now with the pandemic issues. Uh, folks, we, I, I, we have got to make sure that we trust our scientists. We, we've got to make sure. Look. We, it, ever since the pandemic started back in April, when we came home, you know, we, we passed the CARES back, back in uh, late March, and then we recessed because of the pandemic, came home. Every week, I would do a, a Facebook Live media event because I wanted to stay in touch with media as well as people. Um, I did, I went, it wasn't campaigning, it was part of the Senate office building. Every week, except for maybe three in which I had a mayor talking about what they were doing to keep their city safe. I had a, a doctor. I had the State Department uh, public health officer. I had the Jefferson County in Birmingham, the, the health officer. I had people out there that said, I even had Dr. Fauci one time that came on to talk about that because I consistently said, don't listen to politicians about this pandemic. Don't listen unless you hear them repeat what a doctor or an infectious disease expert said don't listen we've got to do that and, it, and the reason it's so important well god there's a lot of reasons it's so important climate is a huge reason it's so important but coming up it is so important because of two things number one this virus is with us it ain't left it is rising and we got to be careful and we got flu season coming up and we've got indoor activities coming up because everybody's going to be in more. And this next six months truly could be worse than the first. That's number one. Number two, when we get a vaccine, we've got to all have confidence in the vaccine. That it is, it is effective, it's as effective as they said it can be, and to get that vaccine. We can, we've got to listen to science. And that has been a problem because the vaccines and this whole pandemic has been so politicized, whether it's wearing masks, or whether it is the vaccines, whether it's in testing, we've got to trust them. The, the, the doctors at the FDA and others, if they, if they approve a vaccine, I will trust it um, to be safe. They're, that's not meaning it's going to be safe for everybody. It's not meaning it's going to be effective for everybody. But the fact of the matter is we've got to trust this vaccine, and that's what we're going to be. And so it's going to be a challenge. So I want you to listen, and I want you to listen to what they're saying at the FDA and the FDA, uh, uh, you know, at the CDC and the NIH, because they're the ones, and the UAB and the other infectious disease experts around the country, listen to what the companies are saying. Because I've, I've talked to these guys in our hearings and on one-on-one, -on -one, and they assure me, and I believe, because I've, I've worked with the government for a long time, that the people within the, the FDA are, are dedicated, they're hardworking, and they want to do the right thing by not just the people of this country, but the people of the world. Because this has got to be a worldwide issue, folks, not just out of the United States of America. So, trust them, please. Thank you. So this next question comes from four separate students, and they all want to know, do you support the expansion of the Supreme Court? Mm -hmm. Nope. <laughs> we don't know. Now, I, this kind of goes back to the filibuster question. It really does. We can't start tearing down institutions of our government. 
just because we don't like them, because we don't like the decisions. You know, back when I was growing up, uh, same thing was, was talked about, because the Warren Court was a lot more liberal. They did a lot of things folks didn't particularly like. But things turn and things change. There may be some proposals about modifying the Supreme Court. I do think this. I do think that the Supreme Court of the United States has now become a political body because of the way it's been handled in the United States Senate. And that's unfortunate. I'm a lawyer, and, and I want to make sure that every time a litigant goes in front of any judge in this country, whether they are a district judge, whether they're an appellate judge, whether they're the United States Supreme Court, they're going to believe that they're going to get a fair shot. You know, and, and we've got nine people on the Supreme Court because not everybody, we always talk about, you know, we always, we always talk about, we, I just want a judge that calls balls and strikes. Well, what the hell does that mean? Okay, it's not, it's not a baseball game. People have different opinions about what's a ball and what's a strike. And it may depend on your perspective of whether you're on this side of the table or on that side of the table. There's nine people on the Supreme Court because intelligent people disagree on the rule of law and the interpretation of the rule of law. So I think instead, I do think that there's some proposals that may have some merit, but I just think right now, packing the court is not, uh, it is not something that I would be in favor of. It got floated by Franklin Roosevelt. It got shot down. Uh, and we, and, and quite frankly, we just, let's just see what happens. You never know what's, what's going to happen with some of this. Everybody is, you know, I got friends up there with their hair on fire right now, you know. But we don't know what's going to happen. At the end of the day, we don't know what's going to happen. So the, the short answer is, I, I would not be in favor of doing that. I, I am a firm believer in trying to stay within the institutions of God. Our next question comes from Karsten Grove. Would you like to ask your question? Yes. Thank you for coming for Albert again, Senator. We all really appreciate it. Uh, my question is, uh, what do you say to people that are worried that a Democrat can't or won't represent the best interests of Alabamians? Well, what does that mean? Okay, what does that mean? A Democrat, I, I have no idea what they're talking about. What, when somebody says that, does it mean that they're not gonna represent the farmers like I just talked about doing? Does it mean they're not gonna represent the military like I've done for the last two years and help? upgrade our uh, nuclear triad and our military folks? Does it mean that I'm not going to support our rural hospitals and try to get uh, he health care out there? Does it mean that I'm not going to, or, or any Democrat is not going to support uh, teachers like the bill that I've got to get more teachers because we've got a teacher shortage in, in Alabama? The, the problem is that, you know, Alabama is not monolithic, okay? We, we are the first state we're diverse yet geographically, we're diverse in people around the room tonight. We're diverse in our beliefs. And so the, the goal is this. The goal is to try to find common ground on those things. That's what I've done the last two and a half years. And I'm gonna tell you something, folks. Tommy Tucker was not gonna be able to do that. You know, I'm gonna tell you, a football coach was, was trained to beat the other side, not to work with. And his us versus them, good versus evil, he has said on the radio that he doesn't even call us Democrats, he calls us communists and Marxists. He ain't gonna be able to work with anybody to get anybody anything done. That's a joke. I got a two and a half years, almost three now, of working with folks because the goal is to find the areas where you can move the state forward, lift the state up, bring everybody to where we all have the ability to get health care, where we all have a living wage, where all of you, when you get out of here, can get a job and that you can keep and you can do things, that you've got a military that's going to protect you, you've got elections that ought to be free and fair, and you ought to have the ability to cast a vote without getting purged from a voting roll, and it needs to be easier to vote. Those are the Alabama values. And the other thing is that we've got to treat people with dignity and respect across the board, everybody. So if somebody doesn't like any of that, and that's what I do, then I can't represent you. But I'm not sure you, <laughs> I'm not sure you have the Alabama values that the people in this room, the people of the state have that I know. So this next question comes from a student asking about election security. Would you like to read your own question? Election security. 
This is the future election security expert that wanted to ask a question. <laughs> I, I will take it, take it on. Uh, so this year, the United States intelligence community warned members of Congress that Russia is attempting to interfere in the 2020 presidential election. What do you believe are the best ways the United States can stop this influence in order to maintain the integrity and security of our elections? Well, there's a couple of things about that. And it, it, it's not just Russia, it is China, it is North Korea, it is Iran. Those are the big four. Uh, Russia is the, the best. They have been doing it, they've been working it, and it's not just the United States. They are also involved in elections around the world. Uh, in every democratic process that uh, Russia is trying to have that malign influence. And so, so you got to break this down into a couple of things. There is, um, there is what I call the malign influence, which is on Twitter and social media, where they are, you know, you, you got some old, you know, fat Russian guy sitting around one day, and 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 in the very sick breath that he's talking about uh, Black Lives Matter and promoting the Black Lives Matter, he's then coming over here uh, promoting the Proud Boys and doing things like that. So. That's the malign influence that we have to watch out for. The interference itself, which is really getting to be a dangerous potential right now, is when uh, foreign countries get access to our internal records. And we have got to do a lot on those fronts. So I want to make sure we talk about both of those. First of all, we've got to get an administration who will really back it, OK? I've got faith in the FBI, in the CIA, and the NSA and others to do the job, but it, leadership comes from the top, and we can't have we can't have a president who is simply denying it and cozying up. We cannot do that. We've got to have somebody out there that tells them we are putting money and resources to st find you, stop you, prosecute you if we can, and certainly impose sanctions. The thing that we can do the best is to try to get our allies and friends around the world to help us because they're at risk as well. And we can get our allies and friends with us instead of just kicking them around sometimes and impose the necessary sanctions, it will stop. We can do it. But we've also got to get money to the states to make sure that they make everything as secure as possible. And we also got to educate uh, the public. And we got to work with the tech companies. I think the tech companies are beginning to see some of the problems and they're starting to put some warnings. They're starting to get rid of all the Russian bots. When I ran in 2017, we were knocking out about 40,000 Russian bots a day on Twitter that was coming in. Every time we post something, I got all these, you know, Vladimir's coming in and saying that. They just knocked. We were knocking them out. So we've got to put more money uh, in there. It's just a fact of life. It is something. But I'm going to tell you something. I, I know this and because I, I, I've been in these briefings. We have got the technology to do it. We've got the will to do it. We've got the greatest powers on earth to do it. But we have got to have an administration that's dedicated to do it. And if you think I'm knocking the Trump administration, I am. I'm sorry. I am. We have got to have an administration who will stand up to Vladimir Putin, President Xi, and others to say this has got to stop. Is that a Republican or Democrat flyer? <laughs> <laughs> It may be a Russian fly. <laughs> uh, Jason Burns has a follow-up question to your uh, discussion about the Supreme Court. Jason, would you like to go? So he asks, what needs to change in your opinion to get the country to be less political? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's a really funny answer, but I'm not going to go there. Um, you know, look. I think we've got to vote that one. Bottom line is, this country is only a, it's, it's political, it's just a reflection of, of the country. You'd be surprised that in Washington, D.C., in the Senate, it's not as partisan as you see. It's really not. I mean, I couldn't have gotten 22 bills passed in, in a, when, when I, I'm not a member of the party that controls the Senate or the presidency. I couldn't have done that if it was as partisan uh, as you see. You know, that goes back to what I was talking about, about the regular order, and you don't see the debates on the floor. You just see political speeches, and it sounds like we just hate each other. We don't. And there's a lot of work. It gets a lot more partisan when you get outside of D.C. When you come to Alabama, it gets more partisan. When you go to any other state, it becomes more partisan. And the reason I think that's the case is because those of us in D.C. that go back, 
They, they campaign and they talk a good game about bipartisanship, but at the end of the day, it's us versus them. It's, it's good versus evil. And so you have only the choice, generally, of, of that. And people vote for partisanship. It's your vote that will change it. It's your vote. And I'm going to tell you, your generation can change it. Your generation can stand up, whether you're a Democrat or whether you're a Republican, you can stand up and say, no, we are not going to play that game. We want to hear issues. We want to hear policies. We want to talk about this. And you come at it from different ways. But don't talk to us about good versus evil. Talk to us about what you're going to do and how we can progress as a country. It is the vote. It is your vote. And I'm going to tell you, your generation is going to have so much more influence than any generation in the last 50, 60, 70 years. And I hope that you have so much influence on trying to get rid of the partisanship. You can do it. Our next question asks, what will you do to help continue the fight against the opioid epidemic? We got to keep that fight up. I mean, it is a combination of things. That was part of a bill that we did. It was the first major bill that we passed to fight opioid, uh, the opioid crisis. Um, we've got a, it, it, it's a combination. You, you can't prosecute your way out of this. I know in Alabama recently we have seen some uh, prosecutions of some doctors and others, uh, pill mills and those kind of things. That is one part of that, but you're not going to get prosecuted out of it. I think right now what you're seeing is a combination of civil law lawsuits. Um, you've seen the big lawsuits, a huge settlement fairly recently. That's going to have a deterrent on this. But I think we've got to look at it a little bit broader too. And we've got to make sure that we do the things necessary to both educate people and we've got to get mental health counseling. We've got to recognize that any addiction like that is a mental health issue. And we don't have enough of it uh, in Alabama or around the country. Uh, and it's easy uh, to, to get hooked and then move from pills to, to heroin. Uh, I, I've seen it too much. I saw it too much in private practice. Uh, and those are access to mental health issues. Those are the kind of things we do. But we've got to, and we've got to work with these companies. The, the bill that we passed, I think, is a really good step because it encourages some, some research and development of less addictive pain medicine. Um, those are the things that we can do. And I think that that is in the works. It's still, a, it's still a problem. It's a problem in Alabama. But I think we're making some headway on it uh, based on the bill that we passed as well as some, some pretty tough FDA law enforcement. A number of students also want to know, what is your stance on the decriminalization of marijuana? I, well, I started to talk about it in, that, in, that, in connection of how do we become less political. But I, that's different. Um, look, I think, we need, I think the federal government needs to get out of the marijuana business. Um, I've been a prosecutor. I've seen uh, I th think now things are changing. Uh, states are doing things. And I think it makes sense right now for the federal government to take marijuana off of the controlled substances list and let the states deal with it. States can deal with it for medical marijuana. You know, it's on the ballot in Mississippi, medical marijuana is. It is in a lot of states. Um, you know, veterans and others that have legitimate prescription drugs, uh, prescriptions for ma ma marijuana, uh, need to be able to cross state lines without fear of being arrested and going to jail. Uh, there's a banking issue that people don't re realize uh, because of this. Because it, it, even though it is legal and you have crops and you have perfectly legal things in states like Colorado and others, you, they can't bank because it's against a federal law. So I think decriminalizing it makes the most sense. Let every state look at it, handle it, and understand, uh, and do that on a local issue. I think that's the way it, to go. And, and the other thing about it, too, if you do that, it's going, to, it's going to open up things more to allow a lot of good research and development. I see the conflicting signs about it, uh, about whether it leads to other addictions. Uh, or whether it doesn't. And I think there's some, there's some conflicting stuff, but the science is only limited because it is a controlled substance and they can't do it. I'd like to see more, but you gotta get it off the controlled substance list. I, and I, I, you can still do that, you can still do that and stop these major importers and stuff like that. 
Um, you can still have a law enforcement component, but not just as a controlled substance per se. Our next question comes from Thomas Chapman. Thomas, would you like to ask your question? Um, there's been a, a, a big move about trying to fix the education problem we have, uh, moving towards more privatization and private schools. Would you support more of that, or would you support investing in the public schools that we have in Alabama to try to bring up the level of education we have? Because I know Alabama typically falls pretty low on the education scale. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're really talking K through 12. Uh, education. I'm, I'm a public school proponent. Okay, I'm a huge public school proponent. I don't like moving toward private schools. And I, I think you got to understand too. I, I grew up in an era where private schools were just Jim Crow schools. Okay, that that was it. Except for the Catholic schools and a, and, a, and a few. Most of them popped up to so so that white kids didn't have to go serve black kids. So I have there's there's part of me that I have a hard time overcoming that. Uh, in a way, but I'm a strong proponent of public schools. I, I agree. I don't think Alabama has invested what they should have. We stay near the bottom. We need to try to get more things. We've got we've got a teacher shortage. We've got to get uh, teachers coming in. I've got a, I've got a, a bill pending right now. It's called the Win uh, Homegrown Program. It gives local school systems and, and communities grants uh, to get high school kids engaged in wanting to teach and coming back to their their communities. I think if we can raise that and get more good teachers in there, we can solve a lot of the, the problems that we've got in education. But it's, it's gonna require more funding. There's no question about that. It is a, really a state issue for the funding more than uh, the federal government. There's a lot that we do for SNAP and you know, meals. I mean, so many, so many kids, you know, so many kids get their best meal of the day at school. And that's unfortunate, but it's a fact of life when you've got the poverty that we've got in the state of Alabama. And so I'm, I'm a strong proponent of public schools. I went to public schools in Alabama. You know, I've lived in Alabama all my life, and I went to public schools. My kids went to public schools. And I think that we need to do more for them. And it's, the, the real problem is that we've got some really great schools. If you've got a great school system here in Auburn, you know, I've been doing the, these virtual things, and the first one I did was at Auburn High School. Um, and we've got some around, but we've got, we've got in the poor states, poor areas, it's, it's really not good. And I think one of the things we can do too is this. We, everybody talks about infrastructure. And when you think about infrastructure bills, people think about roads and bridges and things like that. We need to be thinking about broadband and, um, and school buildings. Those are important if we can get, if the, fed, and the federal government can help there. We can help with new buildings and classrooms and new infrastructure and new and put broadband uh, out to, to folks. That's going to raise the level of education too. So that's just uh, and I'm a most strong proponent. Our next question comes from Hudson Defeat. Hudson, would you like to ask your question? Huh? You would not. So he <laughs> asks, how do you balance the needs of the United States versus those of the world? And if they are competing. What do you draw on to make that decision? That's a, it's a, it's a tough question. Um, I'm not sure that, that you know what makes America great wouldn't help make the world great, but I don't want to be in isolation. I'm certainly not an isolationist. Um, you know, we are, in my view, we're as strong as we are in part because we have helped so many countries in, around the world. And they in turn helped us. When you know you got, if you go back, you know to give you, if you go back and, and look at the last hundred years uh, after World War One, when we were at war with some of the European countries. After World War One, we took a different, we took a, a, a really hard line approach. These were bad people. They attacked the United States. We don't like them. We're not going to do a damn thing. For them. And, and we're going to let them rebuild. We're going to make ourselves great. And look what happened just 20 years later. We saw the rise of Hitler, Mussolini. We were in the Great Depression. And we then ended up in the Second World War. And now we've got Japan coming as well as Germany and, and, uh, and Italy. And so after World War II, we took a different approach. The approach that we took was the Marshall Plan. And we decided it is in our best interest to make sure that France and England and our enemies, Germany and Italy, survive. 
and rebuild. They were in, in, in real trouble. All of those economies were in real trouble. I'm beginning to feel like Mike Pence. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I don't think that I don't think it's an either or question. I really don't think it's an either or question. I think that we have to make sure that we get jobs in this country, but we are not going to, we are part of a global economy now. That's not going to change, folks, because the other countries are not going to do it either. And we have got to do the kind of things necessary to help democracies in this world, to help them stay strong, because when democracies around the world are strong, the United States is still the big component. We are number one right there. And we can depend on them. That's the thing. They need to know that they can depend on us and that if we get us straight, we can depend on them. So I have a, there may be a situation that I can think of at some point or that before we leave, you might even think of a situation where the interest in the United States is in direct competition with other countries around the world, other than the obvious, you know, conflicts in Russia and China. Uh, but I can't think of one. I, I really think our trade policies, we're all connected. And it, our trade policy should help our farmers, not help hurt our farmers. Our trade policy should help our manufacturing and not hurt our manufacturing. But there's also a component. Um, Alabama is an exporting state. We manufacture a lot of stuff and we export it, which means we got to have those markets. They're not going to just send them over to Mississippi. <laughs> they go to China. You don't realize that we're the third largest exporter of automobiles in the country. The third largest. I would never dream that when I was growing up. So we're, all, we're, we're just too connected. So I, I, it's pretty generic. But I would, I would, if you can't think of something specific, we'll come back to you. Okay? Our next question comes from Tyler Ward. Tyler, would you like to uh, ask your question? As someone who persecuted the uh, as KKK member, members, yeah, I got a church from the CC Street Baptist Church of Indiana, Alabama. You probably know more about racial justice than I'm a city senator on this incident. But how can African Americans still be encouraged to trust the system that not only has led to their direct disenfranchisement, but has failed them time and time? Okay, y'all got y'all got a while. <laughs> um, it's a great question. Um, the way you do that was with these folks. The way you do that is making sure that you talk to him. The way you do that is that you make sure that you talk to him and you talk to each other and you understand. You gotta make sure that people in this country know and understand that when you're black in America and you've got kids and they go out at night, you fear for that they won't come home. That's a fact of life, people. That is a fact of life in the United States of America. And it's not because that they're gonna get in trouble with some weird game or something like that. They're, they're worried that they're gonna get pulled over. And folks, let me tell you something. I was a prosecutor. This one's gonna take a little more than a couple minutes. I, I was a U.S. attorney. As he said, I prosecuted the 16th Street bombing that occurred in 1963. I worked with law enforcement all over the state, and I'm a strong proponent of law enforcement, local law enforcement. Law enforcement used to be called peace officers, and they're there for their communities. They're there to protect your communities. But I think we would, we, law enforcement and others have to admit that we've got a problem throughout somewhere that we got to figure out what to do about. But law enforcement is just a part of that. We've still got discrimination in housing, in jobs, in health care. It's just not the fearfulness of going out at night. It's a fear about whether or not you can get a job. It's whether or not if you join the Army that you can rise to the ranks of being a general as opposed to just st staying low. It's all of those issues, and, and, and I think what happened in this pandemic, you know, we made great progress in this country. We cannot and should not ever deny the progress that we've made in this country. We have. It's been remarkable. You guys didn't live in the era that I lived in. And, and it, 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 but as much progress as we have made, we haven't made enough. 
We have not fulfilled the dream of Dr. King. We've not achieved the beloved community that he talked about. And it's because people will look at it in, in both racial terms and their personal terms as whether or not somebody is going to be competing against them. We should be lifting all boats. And I think to do that, you, I go back to this rhetoric and divisiveness that we see in so many politicians that will pit one group against the other. We cannot allow, allow that to happen. I will tell you that I have stood with so many people and said, your voice matters. After George Floyd's death, so many people took to the streets. Peaceful, peaceful demonstrations. I don't condone violence on right or left. And things got out of hand in some cities. And they're getting out of hand in Philadelphia and Maine. And they all, whoever does those kind of things need to be prosecuted. But peaceful demonstrations. John Lewis said, stand up, speak out, cause a little good trouble. Good trouble. And you do that and you talk to your city council. And you talk to your police chiefs. And you talk to your sheriffs. And you talk to your county commissions. And you go down and you talk to your legislatures and the governor. And you explain in those terms. And you get that. And you give examples. It's not just George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Those things happen every day. And we all know it. Give the examples here where in your neighborhoods of things that happen. But let's do it together. Let's talk about these things together. We cannot let this moment pass. I've said that since George Floyd's death. I said it on the floor of the United States Senate. We should not be looking at Black Lives Matter as, as an extremist organization just out to loot and, and, and destroy buildings. There's a reason. There is a reason that people have to stand up and say Black Lives Matter because black people often don't think that people believe that their lives matter. And yes, all lives matter. But I stood on the floor of the Senate and I was proud to do it. I was the only voice from the deep south. And the other thing you've got to do, you've got to vote. You've got to get out and vote. John Lewis said that the most powerful nonviolent tool for change is the vote. And you've got, you got to challenge people like me or Tuberville or anybody else that's running for office. That we shouldn't be down, that we shouldn't be doing like this guy in Prattville did, giving the benediction at the Ku Klux Klan founders' um, birthday party. We got to be talking about all people. And so voting and engagement and community activity. The last thing I would say to do for those of you, step outside your comfort zone. Step outside your comfort zone and talk to people. Do what Atticus Finch said and walk around in somebody else's skin for a little bit and see things from their point of view. When you do that, you're going to understand. And when you do that, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find that no matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you came from, it doesn't matter whether you're white or black or brown, it doesn't matter what religion you are, it doesn't matter if you have a religion. What you're going to find is that we got a hell of a lot more in common and we have the device. And that's what we've got to promote. And every one of us, whether you are a Republican, a Democrat, an Independent, or a Libertarian, or whatever other parties are out there, we've all got to promote that. Because at the end of the day, for this republic to survive, for this state to progress, we're all in it together. And we're going to either rise or fall together. Your next question comes from Joel Lagerman. Would you like to ask your question, Joel? Um, so a lot I love your t-shirt, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to say. Um, a lot of uh, politicians have been talking about, you know, we have to get over this virus and we want to get back to normal. But for a lot of people in this country and a lot of people in Alabama, normal was still a crisis. So what can you and your colleagues in the Senate do to make sure that hopefully someday in the future when we're finally getting over this pandemic that we are rebuilding in a way that lifts up those who were in crisis before. That's a, it's, a, it's a great question. It's, you, you've, been, you've been reading some of my speeches. Okay? <laughs> um, because I've said just that. Um, the normal that we had, even though we had a, a, a growing economy, a booming economy, 
we have to understand that that economy wasn't working for everybody. Even people that were working, the economy was not working for everyone. Uh, people that make $7.25 an hour, the minimum wage, that economy wasn't working for them because they had families and they had expenses and the expenses have grown. So we got to do something to lift that to a minimum wage. That's number one. But we've also got to use this opportunity to kind of restructure so many things, I think. And we can do that. We should, that's, that's what we need to be thinking about right now. I mean, well, I'll say that. Uh, what we need to be thinking about right now is getting out of the virus. And we still need to do another package, of uh, uh, another uh, COVID package that will help the unemployed, that will help businesses, that will help healthcare workers, that will help city and county governments. Everybody's said um, that what we've done in the past, in the last six months on these bills that we've done, which is an incredible amount of money, was a stimulus. All right, when are you going to do another stimulus? This wasn't stimulus, folks. Those were saving. We were trying to save the economy. We were trying to save jobs. We were trying to save people's lives. So it wasn't stimulant. At some point, we're going to start, we're going to get in the back of this. When we, have a, when we have a vaccine, we're going to get toward the back end of this. We're going to start coming out of the health crisis, and we've got to start building and coming out of the economic crisis that it, that it, it, that it has created. And to the young man in the back's question, we've got to make sure that when we do it, we do it in a hell of a lot more fair way than we've done it to begin with. And that means that as we're rebuilding and we're opening these jobs and we're opening the economy, we've got to bring down barriers. That, that We've got to help in education across the board. We've got to lift folks up through their education. We've got to make sure that they have access to jobs. And, and there's a lot of things you can do with something like that. It's not just the high-tech, high-paying jobs. You know, I've got a bill pending right now to, to we, we give incentives just to, to make PPE. You know, that's not going to, you know, somebody's going to work on the line doing that's not going to make $100,000 a year. But they may make 50 or 60, and they get good benefits, and that's not a bad living. And so I do think we've got opportunities to do this, and we're going to be looking at that. I, I can tell you, we're already looking. Housing is a huge issue. Housing is a major issue in this country. Affordable housing, even in our rural areas is a major issue that we've got to do something with. And the federal government is there and primed to do it. States can't always do that. So housing is, is an issue. Healthcare is a dominant issue. Infrastructure like broadband is a huge issue. The things that we can do like that will lift everybody. But then we've got to make sure that we do things for minority institutions, for HBCUs. We can, we can expand Pell Grants. We can do things to make sure that uh, minority entrepreneurs have the same ac access to capital that I might have when I walk into a bank. I've got a bill pending to do just that. So we've got to be strategic. And I think we can be, and I think we will be. The one thing, it's not just one, but the thing that we know about this pandemic, other than your health is dependent on mine and mine's depending on yours, we know that the spotlights have been put on the disparities in this country. And everybody sees it on both sides of the aisle. And everybody on both sides of the aisle will do something about it. I really believe that. I really believe that. And if we can get past the partisanship uh, and, you know, you know the, the electioneering, and if we get people who really want to do it as opposed to just get elected, then I think we can, can do it. I think there's going to be a huge emphasis on it. I don't have all the answers for you right now. I just know that there are people in D.C. that are already talking about trying to do just exactly what you said. We can, you know, it's like the old six million dollar man TV show on the RC. We can build him better. Okay, we've got the technology. We can make him better. And we can make this country even stronger and better and more just and more equal. But we got to start working on it as soon as we can. I have a couple of uh, maybe rapid fire questions as we approach the end of our time. Uh, do you support DC and Puerto Rican statehood? DC and Puerto Rican statehood? I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, it's a great question, and I haven't really thought about it. I don't think it's going to be on the table because it's going to require a, a, a lot of uh, effort. I really don't think it's going to come up. Um, I'm a little bit concerned. Uh, uh, D.C. is as big as a couple of states, and those folks don't have really good representation, and they're kind of a, 
it, it, they get treated real bad. Puerto Rico is, you know, those are American citizens already. Um, I don't think we have, we, we need to look at it as, as whether or not it helps the country and whether or not it would help lift those folks. We then shouldn't look at it as at all. And I would never look at it this way. Is it going to help Democrats? Is it going to hurt Republicans or vice versa? That's the last way to look at it. And unfortunately, that's the way most everybody looks at it. And would you vote to repeal the Patriot Act? The Patriot Act? Now, I had an opportunity to vote to do that. We've actually, we've actually tweaked it a little bit, though. Um, I, I've had concerns about it. I was, you know, as a prosecutor and also did some defense work, um, there were things in there that um, I, that bothered me, but at the end of the day, I think it's something that we need to constantly monitor to make sure, uh, because you've got enough folks uh, that are concerned about it and civil liberties of people. But we're in such a different world right now, so I don't think we can go to, to repeat it. But I do think we, it's a, a monitoring. It will come up for renewal again. We've changed it a little bit, but I think it could change some more if it needs to. A number of students want to know, if re-elected, what would your top legislative priorities be? Get out of the pandemic. I'm just going to write a bill. I said, we're done. <laughs> um, you, you know, look, see, see, in all candor, that, I'm being a little, little trite with that, but in all candor, that's got to be the priority uh, of the next administration. Uh, it's got to be the priority of the next Congress because we're still going to be in it. And we've got to make sure that we do everything that we can. I am going to be very concerned about what's going to happen with our health care. If the Affordable Care Act is declared unconstitutional, uh, then um, that's going to be a problem. I don't think people fully appreciate the fact that the Affordable Care Act means so much to people in Alabama. 120, 30,000 people got health insurance when they did it. 957,000 people in this state have a pre existing condition. Their health care is going to be in jeopardy. When you get, graduate from college, your health care is going to be in jeopardy. You're going to have to buy it on your own uh, until age 26 if the ACA goes away. And that's going to be a problem for you. Trust me. Because you're going to here's what you're going to do if it goes away. You're going to start looking for a job that's got good benefits, health care benefits, as opposed to the job you might just really want to love and, and have. It's a, it's a problem. It's going to bring, it's gonna bring, uh, bring up cost of prescription drugs for seniors. It's going to get rid of so many, so many people in the state will lose their health care. It is going to be an issue. And so this pandemic and what happens with the ACA is going to, I believe, fairly dominate the next process. I, I, I think we have got so many things that I'd love to get done, a lot of them in, in the health care space. I wanted to expand Medicaid. I think the state made a huge mistake by not expanding Medicaid. We lost billions of dollars. We've got to get health care. I am not for Medicare for all. But did the did young Republicans hear that? Uh -huh. <laughs> just, just making sure you heard. Um, not for that, but I do like the, the idea of a public option. I think it would help the markets. And, you know, healthcare and insurance is an all a matter of risk in markets. And, and it's a business, and there's a business model that we have to do. You just can't say, oh, I'm going to protect people with pre existing conditions. Because the business model is going to cost so much more for those folks. And so it, that's why the Affordable Care Act, which, which was never supposed to be a, a, a set in stone, never changed, so it's always going to be a work in progress. And we need to be working to be a little bit more, uh, I, I hope it stays, and I hope we can work with it. That's going to be a huge, huge thing. So the time is now 7 o'clock. Would you like one more? I don't know. I, 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 I mean, how long would we be here? I'm good. I'm just, yeah, yeah let's have a good one. Oh, come on. All right, so our next question comes from Adam Davis. Adam, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. So, uh, Alabama has recently and consistently um, been investigated for overcrowding, deaths, um, cruel punishment in our prisons. And on the state level, Governor Ivey has proposed uh, giving money to more corporate private prisons to try to alleviate these issues. Um, on a federal level, what would you do to reform the um, the inhumanity and cruelty of our prison system and judicial system? Well, it's, a, it, it, it's hard to do from a federal level of the states except monitor. I think the Justice Department, you know, if the, the Trump administration really issued some scathing reports about the outcome of prison system. I was really surprised, to be honest with you. But I, I know a little bit about, and it's, it's not good, I don't like privatizing the prisons or the post office or anything else like that. 
I really think that that is fraught with peril. If somebody's trying to make money off of, of folks like that, we had convict labor in this country for a long time, and it was hard. I don't like privatizing. What I think we have got to do from a federal perspective is look at some of the reforms that the federal government is doing. We passed the First Step Act last year, um, and that is, is helping look at where we might go to give people a better chance. The, the goal should be, the goal should be to punish those that need to be punished, to try to keep kids out of the prison system, and to try to work with communities to make that happen. So it's a really holistic approach but I think that privatizing prisons is, is not a good way to do it. But it's like everything else. It, 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 it requires money. And the state of Alabama hadn't been, you know, hadn't been very forthcoming uh, with this. And, and, and there's the dilemma, guys. I mean, it's a huge dilemma because nobody wants to raise taxes. No, uh, uh, me, I don't want to do that. Nobody wants to raise taxes. Nobody wants a prison in their backyard. But yet, it costs money, but everybody wants to lock them up. And it costs money to do that. I mean, it costs money to do that. And so trying to balance that is very tough. The lawsuits that have been pending that the Southern Poverty Law Center and all that are making some impact. You know, Alabama has traditionally gone from, from you know, they get better and then they get worse again. And it's a, it's a question of funds. And I, I would like to see if we're going to start doing things at the federal level to start giving some grant monies, to start doing some things in, 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 the, in the state prison systems, because that's the, where the real problems are. The problems aren't as much in the federal system, um, even though there's some overcrowded issues there. But the, the, the thing is, this, this can cure itself to some extent if we can enact policies, if we get better education, if we get better mental health. That's the biggest problem in our state prison system. It is when somebody has a mental health issue, we just lock them up and we let the warden deal with it. And that's just the wrong approach. So we can do something, if we can get a control of the mental health issue and we can do better on education, we can get a hell of a lot better control of the prison system and we can do the prison systems where people get punished and they, yes, and, 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 but we do it in a way that is humane and we don't do it in a way that, that what we see going on in Alabama right now. And that's a pretty generic answer without an awful lot of specifics. But we can, do a, we can give a lot of examples, I think, from the federal government. We've done that in, in a lot of different ways. So our last question asks about ocean conservation, written in this lovely lavender color. Does anybody know? Uh, they like to ask their question. Okay. okay, so Alabama is a huge coastal city. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of uh, oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. And so how do you propose we, you know, environment while also not splashing that oil industry and the shipping industry as well right. in conserving the beautiful Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, um, we've got a lot of gas rigs out there too. It's really important. Alabama gets a lot of money uh, from that. But I do think this, I do think that after the uh, deep, uh, you know, deep water horizon uh, spill that uh, oil companies learned a lot. And the technology for helping and doing those things, there were a lot of lessons learned from that. And so I think as we go forward, the technology is going to help that a lot. And I think the federal government can help do all those things. But that also goes back to believing in the science and understanding the science and understanding what happens if there is another disaster and the ecological problems that it could cause and the economic problems it could cause. But believing in the science, and I just think, I have the same feeling, by the way, about nuclear energy. For so long, it was, it was, you know, everybody was fearful of it, but it's a, it's a clean energy. And I think the technology now is such that we can start moving toward nuclear energy. Democrats don't always say that, but deep down they're thinking it because the technology is there. So, um, but yeah, I, I get it. I, I see it. It's important economically, but I think we can do it. And uh, But I, I will say this. I do think that our, our EPA and our environmental standards, have, well, there's have to be some continued rigorous enforcement as well as oversight. I don't think we're seeing that a lot right now with the Trump administration. But there's got to be that, not overburdened. Now, I don't like regulations, but there's got to be enough oversight to make sure people are doing the right thing and not just sliding around so they can make more money. Thank you. Now the floor is yours to deliver any closing remarks you want to make. 
are we done? <laughs> um, well, okay. Let me, let me, I, I want to say a couple of things before I just really close. Because it didn't come up. And I don't, I just, I don't want to leave here. For anybody in this room that's been watching television ads, believe that I am for abortion up until birth. I'm not. At all. It's, it's not true. Period. That's a procedure that's rare. It's a medical procedure. It's an it's a, a issue for families that they struggle with every day. I am not for that. I do believe in the dignity of women. And, the, and, and I think the abortion question is one that's going to become so politicized. And I believe that, that as, as, as I've heard, we can disagree on where to draw the line on some of those, but quite frankly, it ought to be the women who are in their positions who are drawing the lines on so many of those issues. But I don't want anybody to believe those damn commercials. Okay? That's number one. Number two, those of you who like to hunt, those of you who have firearms, I'm not going to take your gun. <laughs> okay? We've, you know, we have eight years of Barack Obama and Joe Biden. Did anybody's gun get confiscated? No. <laughs> we have eight years of Bill Clinton. Did anybody's gun get confiscated? No. Don't believe the ads that I'm against guns. I'm a hunter. I love it. During deer season, my wife says, yeah, 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 go ahead. <laughs> Turkey season, well, okay, you're not going to kill one of those probably, but I, I, my youngest son and I shoot a lot. We have a lot of guns. And, but, I, but I will say this. we got to be careful about gun violence. And there are things that we can do that protects gun owners and law-abiding citizens that believe in the Second Amendment like I do and still save lives. We can do expanded background checks. We can close Charleston loopholes. We can close the boyfriend loophole. We can do those kind of things that doesn't infringe on anybody's Second Amendment. But it could save lives. And that's what I believe. And any ad you see, don't believe it. There's others. Unfortunately, I can tell you that most of what you're seeing from my opponent in his 30-second TV spots is not true. And the one thing you haven't seen from him in any of his 30-second TV spots is what he's going to do for the people of Alabama. What he's going to do about the farmers. Not just talk the good game. What he's going to do about our veterans. Not just have a charity that he only gives 30 cents on the dollar. You haven't seen any of that, folks. Nothing. And he ain't here. And he's not here. He's not talking to the media about it. And he doesn't respect you enough to come here tonight to talk about it, and that's wrong. He sent out a fundraiser after the presidential debate, said Americans deserve to see the candidates debate. See how they do under pressure. Fade away, <laughs> <laughs> Republicans and college Democrats, thank you. To the college Republicans especially, thank you. I knew the Democrats would show up for me. <laughs> but I really mean this because here's the thing, guys, and I said this, I alluded to this earlier. We've got to change the dynamic in this country. We've got to change the dynamic where people can, can talk to each other, not at each other. 
We've got to be able to sit down at a table and, and either break bread or have a drink or do whatever and talk to each other and importantly, listen to each other. We've got to be able to do that. I think I've done that the last two and a half years in the United States Senate. I think I've done it in my career. As a lawyer, if I didn't listen to my clients, if I didn't understand the other side, I wasn't going to have any success. And I did okay as a lawyer. But we have got to do that. And your generation has this opportunity. Your generation grew up without the baggage of segregation, at least legal segregation. Your, your generation grew up with gay friends. Your generation grew up in a different world, in a different way, where you, you should and I think do respect each other. But you guys can do this. You know, I, I did a film the other day, and I can't remember. It was, it was, it was for uh, some of you guys. It wasn't a political one. It was, it was the group about coming together sports-wise, Alabama versus Auburn. And, and it was put, put it all on the field during the game and leave it all on the field. And that's what we're doing here tonight. And I, I, I really do appreciate this. I'm going to tell you, in the United States Senate, one of the biggest problems that we have is that the Democratic Caucus has lunch with, each, with us two times a week, and we have another thing on Wednesdays. We're only up there Monday night through Thursdays. The Republicans do the same thing. We don't have lunches together. We have to try to make that. And when we're so busy, we're only up there Monday through Thursday, it's hard to do. It's one of the reasons. There's several reasons I do it. But I like to go to the, the Senate prayer breakfast on Wednesdays because it's, 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 it's one of those times where we can really talk. It's why I like to go to the floor before the pandemic and just hang out, sit over there and talk to my colleague Richard Shelby from Alabama and catch up on things and how we can work together. And I can talk to other folks. we got to have more of that. We got to have more of that, and I, I, I want y'all to seriously think about it. I want you to think about how you interact politically. Get your signs, wear your buttons, cast your vote. But at the end of the day, it's one Alabama. It is one Alabama. It doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or Democrat. It's one Alabama. It's one America. And we got to start acting like it. We got to start acting like it, and we got to start voting like it. And if we can do that, the sky's the limit. And you are going to be the catalyst. I can tell you, your generation is going to be the catalyst of some of the greatest changes this world has ever seen. But do it for the right reasons. Follow your moral compass, because you know what's right. Follow your moral compass, not just your political compass. Thank you all so much. For that.